led me here for someone. I, I wrote down just a few little statements here this morning. And I, I want to read these four statements that I wrote down. We're going to be in Jonah. Jonah, the book of Jonah, the third chapter. Y'all familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale? Amen. I love that story. Remind me of you. <laughs> Somebody get off of this. Okay? I said it reminds me of you. And me. Want to include that. Because many times when we read the scripture, I, I've heard it. Many people try to say, well, this is just a story. No, it isn't. This is a happening. People say, well, the whale can't swallow a man. Oh, when God prepares a whale, it can swallow anything God wants it to. Amen? I'm amazed at how God prepared the whale. Now it's called two things in the scripture. One place it's called the great fish. Other places it's called the whale. It was a great big whale that was a fish. Okay? You got that? <laughs> Amen. It doesn't contradict itself. Uh, we need to understand that when God wants something to happen, it happens. And this morning, I want to read these four thoughts to you and we're going to be preaching on this. Whatever calling you have in your life, you entered it equipped. Now we wrestle with that, don't we? God, I'm not equipped. Who called you? If God called you, He equipped you. You may not know it all. You may not understand the fullness of what God is calling you to do. But how many of y'all trust God that He can equip you as you go? Amen. Okay? Number two is finish the call to your potential. Some have greater potential than others. But I tell you, whatever God called you to do, if you go with God's potential, it's big enough. Okay? So, number three, don't doubt your potential. How many of y'all have ever been called to do something and you have doubt of your ability? Come on. See, this is the biggest cause of the church not stepping out in faith. In Christ, all things are possible, right? Yes. Don't we say that all the time? Yes. Well, now, if Christ is, in, a, in, in all things are possible in Christ, don't doubt your potential. I'm glad you're not reading my writing. <laughs> the fourth thing I want you to ask yourself, who is your master? Who is your master? Is it God or Satan? Your answer. Your answer. If God is your master, and we really believe that through Christ all things are possible, we can do what we never thought we could accomplish. Praise the Lord. Now, you all got to get better than this this morning. I mean, as I told him last Sunday, and I love to hey, hear an amen every once in a while. I, I, I've been longing <laughs> to preach to the church again. I, I love my amen corner. Brother Doug, I love hearing you clap your hands. Worship, and I, I love hearing people worship from their heart. Man, I tell you what, I have missed this so much. Where God's people feel the freedom. Praise God. If God puts a dance in your foot, dance on it, all right? If God puts a shout in your voice, shout it, amen? We need to understand we're here to worship God. 
not man. I know this is being taped. Don't worry about the tape recorder. Amen. We're here to worship God. We're here to praise God. We're here to lift up the name of Jesus. And so many times we get the Jonah effect. And I call it the Jonah effect because everybody talks about somebody when they don't fulfill their calling having a Jonah spirit. Isn't that right? All right. Used to when the old seagull and man <coughs> was crossing the seas, they were very superstitious. Superstition and sailors kind of run hand in hand. Uh, if something goes wrong on a ship, it's usually because of a person. They have something wrong with them. They've done something. People go through rituals before they board the ship. It's like a baseball player, man. Some of them have a ritual they go through. They listen to the same song before every game. They wear the same pair of shoes, have to wear the same jersey, have to put their belt on the same. I mean, there's many rituals that people go, now those are superstitions. But those things cause doubt. If you don't do it, you feel like a failure. And on a ship, if he's out to sea and the, the waves begin to lap over the sides of the boat and things begin to go wrong, Many times there are superstitions. I want to say something to the church. In Jonah's case, there was something wrong. In Jonah's case, he had went against the principles of his calling. And just like many of us, God said, go north, you go south. God says, go east, we go west. God says go up, you go down. When God says go down, you go up. Isn't it amazing how rebellious of the people that those that profess to be Christians are? Well, people say, no, the church is not rebellious. I'm going to tell you something real quickly. If the church wasn't rebellious, the church would be full. Amen. 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 Now, this didn't happen overnight, and it's not going to be repaired overnight. It's going to be repaired by the people of God that walk in faith, are obedient, and have a change of heart. But like, can we do it? Absolutely. I'm trusting God to give the church a change of heart. If y'all would stand with me just for a moment, we're going to read four verses here. And if time permits, I'll be preaching on more than just four verses. But I want to read the first four verses of chapter 3 out of the book of Jonah. And the word of the Lord came upon Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it, unto it the preaching of that I bid you. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You think about that. In 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Our Father, our God in heaven, Lord, we just ask right now, Lord, that you bless and that you anoint this word this morning. Father, I pray that every ear that hears the word today will respond to the Spirit of God. Lord, that we recognize, Lord, by your calling, and by your leadership that we must go where you send us to go. We must say what you tell us to say. Though popular or not popular, Lord, we must be about our Father's business. Lord, help me to be a greater example of these words. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go back and kind of 
highlight some of Jonah's failures. Jonah being a man, not much different than you and I. You say, Brother Mike, I have never been like Jonah. I've never been on a boat that is tossed and turned. I tell you what, I bet most of us have laid in a bed and tossed and turned because of your rebellious spirit. Amen. Yes, come on. I, now I, I have tried to choose not to use that word bed, so forgive me. I would assume that most of us have found ourselves in situations in our life when the dealing of the Holy Ghost begins to churn your inner man with a calling, with a longing to fulfill the commission that God has placed us in. That we have rejected it. And maybe after our rejection, we have seen the consequences in our own life or the life of others. I want to talk this morning about Jonah's consequence just for a moment. In verse 1 of chapter 1 in Jonah, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Call number one. <laughs> God spoke by the Spirit to the man named Jonah. Now, I don't know if Jonah had ever had such an experience as this before. The Bible doesn't record if he had or if he had not. But I want to tell you, this was an experience that Jonah knowed who spoke to him. There was not a doubt in Jonah's mind who was speaking to him. Even though he knew it was the God of heaven, Jehovah, he still had a problem, just like you and I have a problem. He felt unqualified. And this is the message that I want the world to get today is when you feel unqualified, doubt begins to seethe in your spirit and you begin to be afraid. Amen. That's the truth. Yes. When we feel unqualified and we feel, even though we know without a doubt that God is speaking to us, we begin to judge ourselves. Yes. Number one, when you stand before God, you will not judge yourself. God will judge you. I want to say this to those that are believers this morning. Your past has nothing to do with your future. Amen. 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 What your failures have been has nothing to do with your successes. Amen. What we need to understand by our failures, we have learned from experience not to go back. But by our successes, we learn that there is greater things that we can accomplish than we ever thought we could. Amen. I think of some great men in this world, in our society. Think of a man like Sam Walton. Wasn't that educated of a man, but let me tell you what, he was very successful. He failed many times. Finally, he put his trust and faith in God. And look what God done to that business. Man like J.C. Penney's, amen. A man that put his trust and faith in God. Give God 90% of every dime he made. Look how God prospered that business and made it successful. I heard this last week. They're filing bankruptcy. You know what happened? They turned away from God and they began to go the other direction. That's exactly what happens when we turn our face away from God. The man that owned ball, Bob Allen Company. Another man that gave God 90% of every dime he made. Paul, it's still going today. Amen. We need to understand when we put our faith in God, it doesn't matter how many times you failed. It matters about the successes that God will make happen in your life. Amen. You may have been a drug addict, a drunkard, a prostitute. 
You may have had babies aborted. I don't care where you've been in your life. When you've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and God begins to place a calling in your life, that calling is not just for you. It's to change the hearts of others. Amen. Amen. You say, but Brother Mike, I've been a failure. I've had marriages that failed. I've done this or I've done that. Let me tell you something. Before the blood of Jesus, God don't hold that against you. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. When you're forgiven and washed in the blood of the Lamb, all of your past is history. Yes. And if you have sinned since you've been a believer, you still have an Advent Father. And God buries those sins too. They're remembered no more against you. Yes. Praise God. Isn't it a wonderful thing to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? To know that we have a destiny and a place called heaven because our names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. People say, Brother well, Mike, what if you're wrong? I say, what if I'm right? Amen. 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 If I'm right and you're wrong, you're in trouble. I've got it good. People say, well, what if you're wrong? Well, if I'm wrong, then I'm just going to the grave. But I'm not wrong. Amen. I know that Jesus lives in my heart. I know that the Spirit of God has changed my life just like He did Jonah. God called an unwilling subject to go and preach to Nineveh. You think God knew its response? Yes. God foreknew Jonah's ideas and his thoughts. He seen Jonah sneaking out at night buying a ticket to get on the wrong boat. Amen. Jonah didn't hide nothing from God. He got on the wrong boat. The Bible says he went the opposite direction. Amen. When he got on the boat, he rose up to, to flee into Tarshish. By the way, that's the opposite direction from Nineveh. He began to flee. What happened? A great storm. It said that the Lord sent the storm. Some people say, well, I don't know why everything's going wrong in my life. Well, are you denying what God has called you to do? Well, I believe the Lord, but I still ain't getting up. You're right, my life. Let me tell you what. Are you doing what God called you to do? When you're in a state of rebellion, God cannot bless rebellion. I get tired of all these preachers standing in the pulpit taking the people's ears and saying, well, God loves you no matter what you do. I'm going to tell you what. God does love you but he despises your evil ways. Amen. Amen. We need to understand, we serve a God that demands obedience. As a parent today, we've got many moms and dads and families that try to appease their children with love and give them everything they want. That isn't parenting. That's being their buddy. I tried to make sure my boys were taken care of, but I did it with an iron fist. I love them with love. I forgive them for anything, but I demanded respect and obedience. Amen? That wasn't being mean. That showed, that showed the world that I loved them. Then now I look at them. I'm tell you what, guys, I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of what they've grown up to be. I'm proud that I have two young men that have wives and children. Amen. And I'm proud that they're trying to raise their children like I raised them. You say, but Brother Mike, what if you did it wrong? Well, if I did it wrong, the Word of God's wrong. Yeah. I did it by the Word of God. And as we look at Jonah here, getting back to Jonah, amen, the Bible says the mariners even begin to pray. Those on the boats, they begin to pray. Now Jonah, he was so afraid, he knew the problem on the boat. Just like something you know is a problem in your life. Amen. Amen. I hope I'm talking to a lot of people out there on YouTube or Facebook. Amen. You may know the problem in your life and it's called rebellion. There may be even some here in this what little small group we got here today. You may be facing the same thing in your life. Well, why say you're not going right, my family? Let me tell you what, my boys wasn't angels. Well, they might have been on the wrong side, angels, but uh, they wasn't perfect kids. But I corrected them. 
I told my, let me tell you how I told my boys. Now, this may make some of y'all sick. I told my boys, and I said, as long as you live under my roof, when I'm in church, you'll be in church. As long as you eat my food, we'll bow our head and pray before any food goes in your mouth. If it goes in your mouth first, you're good to pray. <laughs> That's right. I told my boys, you don't own your bedroom, they're mine. This is my house. You don't think I can go through your door? I'll take your door off the hinges. That's right. Didn't I, Lisa? And I did. Yeah. Your lives are my lives. And her mom used to remind him, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. That's a joke. But I raised them to be men. I raised them to have character. I raised them to work. I always told them there's no shame in any work. There's shame when you don't do it right. Church, we need to get across that Jonah had been called. I believe Jonah had probably been a pretty good man because God called him. God saw potential. Amen? When God called him, he knew he could do it. Why did Jonah run? This is his first question. Why did Jonah run? He didn't think he could accomplish what God was saying. Poor old Jonah. <laughs> and you ought to say, poor old man. Because that's the state many of us are in. God said, you to go. I can't go. Yes, you can. I don't have the resources. Step out of faith and do what God's called me to do. God will provide the resources. He'll use somebody, somewhere, to provide what needs to be accomplished. The, those on the boat, the Bible says on the ship, they began to pray. They were scared. And what was going on with Jonah at this time? He was asleep when this first started. And they were scared. God was asleep. Why in the world is he sleeping in the storm? Kind of reminds me almost of Christ when the boat was tossing and turning. Jesus was laying there asleep. But Jonah, I think he was just flat, exhausted from running. I don't think he had the peace that Christ had when he was asleep on the boat. <laughs> so that way, Jonah, and they tell him to pray too, because they knew who he was. They didn't know he had headed the wrong way. But they know something was wrong. All right? They began to cast lots on who was the problem on the boat. <laughs> in other words, they got a bag full of stones and painted one of them black and the rest of it was white. Everybody raised their hand in the back of the south. I see them cast lots. I don't know if that's exactly how they did it, but that's how I assume they've done it. They dug their hand in and lo and behold, we came up with a black stone. It was Jonah. He was a black sheep on the boat. You think that was divinely guided? I believe that was divinely guided because let me tell you something. Jonah knew when he raised his hand in the back, he was the one. Come on. He knew. And then what's the Bible say? It says he confessed. He confessed. Y'all need to go home and read this for yourselves because I'm just highlighting this. He confessed, I'm the problem. Why are you the problem? God told me to go to Nineveh and had to touch him. Huh? Why? Well, I didn't want to go to Nineveh. Is that a good enough answer to God? Huh? Oh, gosh. God said, God says, hey, I want you. I want you in 10 by 2. Let me tell you where you need to be headed. 10 by 2. And by the way, that is a place. I just thought that was the same for years. Yeah. That is a place. It's in the middle of the desert. Lord, I don't want to go to Timbuktu. Okay? I have no desire to go to Timbuktu. It ain't hard on my lives there anymore, so surely God would never send me to Timbuktu. All right, that's the whole <laughs> But Jonah confessed. Then he asked them to do something that sounds strange. He asked them to throw him overboard. They didn't want to. And then they they didn't want to throw John overboard. <laughs> well, they said they didn't want to throw John overboard. But you know what? When the storm got so violent, they were willing to throw John overboard. 
But when they threw Jonah overboard, something had already been prepared. God already knew how to get Jonah from point A to point B. Huh? The oceans were rough. I can almost see that boat almost climbing straight up, falling straight down. Now, I don't know about you. I wouldn't even want to be in a metal boat doing that, let alone a wood boat. But here they are, right of their life. Man, get this dude off of this boat. That'd be my thinking. They threw him overboard. The Lord had something happen when he went overboard. The Lord had a great fish just waiting on him. A whale. And he swallowed him. Wow. Now you talk about a ride. The Bible says it went to the pits of hell. <laughs> you think about it. He went to the bottom of the ocean. He was down there for three days and three nights. This is almost a replication of Jesus Christ in the belly of hell. Amen. Jonah was down here for three days and three nights, rock, rocking back and forth in his acid gut, <laughs> seaweed hanging on to him, all the krill around him. I can almost picture this. But here he was, and all of a sudden, the fish swims up close to the shore and pukes him out. Well, I bet that was a scene. It barks. Jonah comes flying out of his mouth. Now Jonah's sore. You read the story. Jonah was very uncomfortable. He had been literally in the belly of a fish. What happened in the belly of a fish? In the belly of a fish, fish do like, how many of y'all know fish have airbags? Y'all know that? When, when a whale comes up and, and sucks water through its it, it's, it's nose hole on the top of the head, for a better like word. Okay? It not only stores air in the, its airbag, it swallows air. And a well could stay down for a long, long time. Long, long time. I imagine the air was so stale he could barely breathe. Can y'all imagine living in a gut for three days and three nights? Come on. Your skin start to peel off from the acid digesting you. You try to crawl out, and then you think, well, if I crawl out now, I'm going to be in real trouble. So you crawl back in. You say, well, Mike, no way all that happened. Let me tell you what. I don't think he just laid down and cried. I think he's trying to figure a way out. Every time that fish comes to the top of the water to get a breath of air, I, I can almost assume Jonah was trying to look out the peephole to see what was next. Okay? You say, well, Mike, it's not what had happened. That's why I want it to happen, okay? So I think about that, but when he got puked up on the shore, he, he, he cried out to God. And the Bible says that God caused, caused this gourd to grow up. Remember that story? Yeah. It's part of it. And the leaves literally shaded him. He was probably white as a ghost. All the pigmentation had been took off the top of his skin. This man had been in a place he didn't want to go, but God had spared him. And by the way, where did God drop him off at? Yeah. Right next to Nineveh. Yeah. <laughs> Jonah thought, well, I'm in no hurry. So he just laid out for a few days. You know what happened? You know, I'd have thought by the time I went through all this and I figured out I was close to Nineveh, I'd be jumping up and running to Nineveh to preach the word to him after God had spared my life in such a miraculous fashion. But no. He laid out for a few days. And God thought, man, is Jonah ever going to get up and go preach what I told him to preach? So what did God do? God sent a worm. The worm killed the gourd. The gourd wilts. Jonah's shade's gone. I can picture Jonah waking up in the morning. Look at that sun shining in my eyes. Because through the night, the gourd had wilted. The big old leaves, they were gone. Oh, man. 
I wonder if there's another gourd around here anyway. I'm sure he looked around to try to find relief. But there was something stirring in him. And this is when the Lord, I took a long road to get here. This is when the Lord spoke to him the second time. The second time. God said, and the word of the Lord came into Jonah the second time saying, Arise. Get up. Get up. Go to Nineveh, to that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I did you. <laughs> Number one, I, I can imagine uh, going into this city was not just, it wasn't just about preaching. It was about dying. Come on. It wasn't about just preaching. It was about dying. Because he knew that in himself, if he went into the city and made the declaration that the Lord told him to make, that he was going to get killed. This was not a good place. This was a huge city. But I tell you what, after God had done all that God had done, and then God speaks to him the second time, he thinks, it's time to move. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceedingly great city, a three days journey. It took three days to preach from one side of this city to the other. Now by the way, he wasn't just walking, he was walking and preaching. Well, that probably made him a little small, okay? Because the people needed to hear what God had to say. So many times we get so caught up in the moment, we just want everybody, we want to preach a one-time message and let it go. Church, the message of God is not a one-time message. It is a continual message to the souls that are lost. Amen. And as he went about it, it says, so the people of Nineveh believe God and proclaim the fast. Now, by the way, I have always misunderstood this story. It wasn't the king that declared the fast first. It was the people. He started preaching, and then the people heard, and they was willing to repent, and they called the fast. There was a movement happening. Hey man, people say, well, I pray my president gets that move of the Spirit. I'm going to tell you something. God showed me. God's waiting on the church to feel the move of the Spirit. And then God's going to start moving in our government. And then God's going to start moving in territories that we've never seen God move before. What's going to happen is God's people have to get, get on fire for God and preach the gospel to the lost, the unsaved. And when we see men and women coming to the faith of Jesus Christ, there's going to be a revival in this nation. And God is going to pour out His Spirit for this day. I believe this with all my heart. God is going to begin a movement of His Spirit. You're going to see people getting saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost as we've never ever dreamed having before. Because the power of God is real. <laughs> they call it fast. They didn't just call it fast. They put on sackcloth and ashes. That's like they wrapped themselves in burlap bags and put ash on it and begin to cry out to God. They weren't just crying out to God, God spare us. They was crying out repentance. It ain't good enough to say God just spare us. We've got to repent. Don't repent to me. Repent to God. Some of you need to repent to your wife. Some of you need to repent to your husband. Some of you need to repent to your children. Some of you need to repent to your workers, your co-workers, and maybe some of you need to repent to your employers and employees. You say, well, Mike, do I have to do that? I, I'll accept Christ if I don't have to go through the rest of it. No, it's all got to happen. Amen, church. We need to understand that when God moves, God demands a greatness to break out within us. That greatness is not about the flesh. It is about the Spirit of God within us. Amen? Those that were bitter and evil and angry will become sweet and loving and kind. 
Amen. I believe I serve a God that can take a broken soul and turn it all the way around. I mean that I serve a God that can take the bitterness and turn it into joy. Amen. We need to understand that God is alive and well. It says, and then the word comes to the king of Nineveh. And then the word comes to the king of Nineveh. <laughs> he seen the move of the Spirit. He seen the people changing. He saw the evidence of what God was doing. <coughs> Praise God. And the Bible says he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He took off his finery. He took off the best that the nation had to offer. And let me tell you, Nineveh was one of the wealthiest cities in the world at that time. He took off all of his finery and he just wrapped himself in sackcloth and sat in a pile of ashes. The king. The king. The leader. You say, I bet I'll never see our president do that. I'll tell you what, I believe we've got a God. Amen. That can break the struggles of men. Amen. I love our president and I pray for him. I love our Congress and our Senate. I may not agree with all of them, but I pray for him. Why? Because the Word of God demands me to. We need to understand. We have more of a purpose than we understand. And he says that he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast. And it, not even your animals. Your beasts. That's talking about your cattle, your, your sheep, your, your, your donkeys, your horses. Amen. Everything. Herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not be fed nor drink water. Well, I want to fast, but I want my water. Now that, we're talking about total fast here. The king decreed that this is the way it was going to be. But it said, But let man and beast be covered with the sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let him turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. I'm going to tell you how they wasn't praying. They wasn't just whispering words to God. The king made the decree that they would cry out. I don't know if y'all ever heard Middle Easterners start crying out. But they wail. And they cry. And they scream. And they holler. And they worship. Come on. I was watching YouTube the other day. They was taking a bunch of... Uh, of Muslims out there that have been born again. <laughs> now Christians. Take them out of the hundreds and baptize them. I tell you what, I, I was watching that and I felt the power of the Holy Ghost. I almost wanted to jump up and dance. Amen. I mean, they were shouting. It wasn't like a baptism here in America. They was worshiping God with everything they had within them. I can almost see the men and women of Nineveh sitting in their sackcloth and ashes Screaming out to God, Oh God of heaven, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our violence. Okay, it was a vile city. They overthrew everybody by force. Somebody come into that city, had something the minimum wanted, they took it. I was reading a little history on that over this week. And it talked about it was a place where they didn't even bother to remove the dead from the streets. It was a terrible place. Somebody come in trying to trade. They didn't want to trade with them. They just took their goods. They just kill them and leave them laying in the street for the dogs to eat. And the hogs. And by the way, the dogs and the hogs cleaned up the body. It was a bloodthirsty place. But when the power of God through the prophet of God showed up to the seat, let me tell you something. I believe that godly men and women can with the anointing of God walk in front of the worship clinics and cry out in the name of Jesus 
and begin to declare, declare, declare the gospel of Christ. I believe we can see the men and women that work in places fall on their face before God and repent of the evil that they have done. Amen? Of the violence that they have committed against the unborn. I believe we can see young mothers walking in to have their baby's lives taken, fall on their face and declare the decree that that is a body, a living soul in their womb. I believe that God can raise this nation back up to be a Holy Ghost, holy filled nation, a nation of God. Amen. Not a nation separated by strange doctrines. Amen. I believe that we can worship God together. I believe that revival can break out in this land to the point that bars will be closed. Amen. I believe that we can see such a vision from God that we won't even recognize what America has become. Amen. I drive up the street yesterday. Everybody I met was just waving. I wonder, man, who do I look like? And I begin to think, there's a change happening. It's a change. Every car I met, just waving at me. I walk by people, drove by people walking. They just waving. Like you're glad to see somebody. I mean, you like some people up in the house long enough, they'll be glad to see a dog walk by. You know what? I begin to realize the church has an opportunity right now to offer love, not violence. Amen. To show compassion, not bitterness. We need to have so much love in our hearts that we win the loss to Christ. See, people think that Christianity is a bunch of fruitcakes that want to destroy the world. Amen. We're not a bunch of fruitcakes. We're the only church that believes in love and compassion and life and living together in peace and harmony. Amen. We're the only ones that Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I come to save the world. Amen. We need to preach the gospel that we serve a God of compassion. But if you choose, if you choose to denounce the faith, there is a reckoning coming. It isn't from man. It's from God. Amen? Listen to this this morning. God learned a lesson. And the Bible says in verse 10, there's only 10 verses in this whole chapter. The Bible says that God saw their works. Let me tell you something happens after repentance. Works. After you repent, you start doing things right. Amen? He said, Brother Mike, I, I mess up every once in a while. That ain't what God's looking at. God's looking at your potential. God's looking at your works. What you're striving to do. God's looking at the whole man. He says, they turned away from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them. And He did it not. In other words, God said, well, since they repented, I won't destroy it. Says they repented. I will take it out. Let me tell you what was going to happen. They was getting ready to face the wrath of God. Now I don't want anybody to think I'm a quiet, but I'm going to tell you something. If America don't turn to God and continues in its evil ways, God will remove the blessings from this nation. We have been the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. We have everything. If y'all don't believe me, go to some foreign countries. I've been in places where people had nothing. Nothing. But I, the poorest of the poor here in America, they may whine they don't have a steak or hamburger because they don't like a can of peas. Well, let me tell you what, you can open it up and eat it and you'll live. Yep. It isn't about what we want, it's about what God has provided. Amen. Church, we need to repent. Why do you say church? Because the church, I'm going to read these three things here again, and I know I'll probably really run late. Amen. Amen. You entered the call to quit. I shared a little story with Lisa that I heard. You take a kernel of corn, and you plant that kernel of corn. Corn is in the grass family. Did y'all know that? <coughs> First thing that comes up in that corn is the grass. Did you ever see it come up? Behind that grass falls a stalk. 
And that little kernel of corn, when it started out, it knew that the roots had to go down and the leaves had to go up. Why didn't it? Why? Just by chance. Why didn't the leaves go down and the roots come up? It don't work that way. By design, that kernel of corn has enough knowledge in it to know that the root goes down. I plant a seed of corn in your garden, break it back and look. The leaves don't start on the bottom and the roots don't start on the top. You can lay every other kernel of corn in the opposite direction and the root will always go down and the leaves will always come up. That root's looking for water. What's that top looking for? Sun. It comes out of stalk. It grows and it grows and it grows. And it grows. And then it starts tasseling. And then you see little nodules start coming out of the stalk. Some stalks have one nodule, some have two, some have three. You've got a real good corn, you might have four ears of corn on one stalk. Now that's really good and good. Okay? You can let that corn ripen. And you can take and you can shell every grain of corn off of that stalk. And you can plant every kernel. And every kernel will follow the mother maiden seed. The root will go down. The grass will come up. The stalk will come up. If you got good corn, Good seed produces good corn. You take care of it in good dirt and you fertilize it in the right manner. You just keep getting better corn and better corn and better corn. Let me tell you what, when God planted you in your mother's belly, you knew the Spirit of God. And God already had <coughs> your seed being ripened that your roots would be in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen? And the fruit would be to save the lost. There's more than eating food. We need to sow spiritual food. So people say, well, I'm not equipped. You were equipped from your womb. <coughs> you were equipped when God created you. You gotta go forth by faith. You have to finish your call to your potential. Well, it's my potential, whatever God calls you to be. Don't doubt what God can do in your life. I want you to do a thing on this. Many of us doubt. Who is your master? Who are you following today? Are you following God or are you following the world? Choice is yours. Would you all stand with me right now, please? Praise God. I want to pray. If there's anyone here that wants to pray, I invite you to pray. If there's anyone out there on YouTube or Facebook, you want to pray, I invite you to get a hold of me. I'd be glad to pray with you. Just put a text on the church's account. I would be glad to talk with you about the Lord Jesus Christ. That you can fulfill your potential. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we speak faith. We speak hope. We speak life. Father, I pray right now, if there's anyone that wants to pray this, God, that they can feel the freedom to bow their knee before the throne of God's grace. To confess that we have sinned against you the trespasses of our sin has separated us from our God. Lord, that we could pray with an honest heart that our lives would be changed. Father God, that we not only be saved, but we be sanctified. That we ask for the infilling of the Holy Ghost that you would lead us and guide us in all truths. Father, this is my prayer today. Lord, use us. 
Father, grant us your favor. In Jesus' name. Amen.